All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, how were you last two days? Good? Good. Nice. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, packages and versioning. And um, I'll first introduce myself briefly. I'm the lead developer and architect of Simplify.net, uh, which is, an, uh, for some of you might know, an online platform for everything around profiling and publishing and, uh, IGs, profiles, and everything or surrounding uh, conformance resources. Um, I've been doing that since four years. Um, so that's, uh, and I've been with, uh, as you can see, with the dev day since the beginning. Um, probably not every one of you, but maybe you do. Uh, most people uh, probably know it, but um, not everyone might know everything around profiles. There are a lot of uh, first timers here and a lot of people who have had an introduction into fire, but not necessarily everyone knows all the details. So I'll give a very brief general introduction into um, what problem we are, uh, where the problem is that we're trying to solve. And the um, area that we're going to talk about is um, conformance resources, and I'll call them uh, data contracts today or conformance resources or profiles, uh, but people from HL7 version 3 have a completely different notion of what a profile is. Um, and if you're at parties and you say to someone that you're doing something with profiles, then you don't have a good talk, you, you don't have something that people understand. So um, even if you get a nice conversation about IT in a, in a party, it's better to talk about data contracts than about profiles. Um, so Profiles and uh, conformance resources in general um, are the resources themselves that define all the resources, that define how the messages go over the wire. So they're the definitions of um, all the messages that are, are in fire. Um, in the right, you see a brief example of how you can present uh, the definition of a resource. I will not go into that today. Um, but you have an indication this way. Um, so there are lots of different kinds of resources. There are the resources that describe all the resources, which you see at the top left. There are a lot of terminology definition resources. Um, there are um, server configuration resources. And of course, in Fire, we have also defined the data types in a, in a similar way. So data types are, are themselves not officially resources, but they are made of of the same kind of structure, and the resource definitions on the top left are built up from the data types you see on the right. And all programmers here will probably recognize uh, 90 to 100% of those types because they're very standard. Now, um, the r way we communicate structure definitions and profiles data contracts in general in FHIR is a little bit different from how we communicate normal resources because a normal resource has an ID and that the ID is unique on the server where it lives. When you get that resource from a server and you send it to another server, it will probably get a different ID. For a structure definition, a data contract, that is not very useful because you want to communicate between different parties, between different servers, so you need a globally unique identifier. And that's what we call in FHIR SGU3 a canonical URL. It is actually a URI. And in R4, we are going to call it a canonical because it's going to be its own data type. And here on the uh, left, you see some examples of canonical resources from the FHIR core specification. Uh, one of patient, allergy intolerance, one of the data type string, and one of a value set. Um, and these, although they look like URLs, they are not. They can be because, you know, we believe in FHIR that it's good to have a physical location somewhere on the internet where you can find your documentation. So it's a good practice to have a canonical that is actually a URL where you can find the documentation of the resource that it identifies but it's not necessarily the case. So in essence, it's an identifier, but it should be a readable identifier, a little bit more than, for example, 
uh, OID or something. Um, now, what is the problem that we're facing today, or rather in the past three years, um, that is that there will always be a next version. So if you look at the same patient canonical from the patient structure definition, you see there's one for DST1, there's one for DST2, one for SU3, and there will be one for R4, and they will be exactly the same. And so they are not globally unique identifiers. Because if I give you that canonical URL, you won't even know of which fire version I'm talking about, let alone which version specifically of a implementation guide. So um, the first thing we tried <coughs> in fire to solve that problem is um, by changing the canonical itself. You cannot see it here, but there's, an, there's that, that uh, the line of the URL hides the underscore better in the space that you think you see there are underscores there. So that is a canonical URL that has become version specific. Now in itself, that solves part of the problem because now you, once again, you have globally unique identifiers. Um, but the problem is, of course, that your canonical also changes while you actually, in the basis of it, you're still talking about the same resource. The resource has changed a little bit. There might be some fields new in the next version, or maybe a, 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 a fixture or a, 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 some other little detail. But in, its, in essence, people would like to talk about the same resource, and it would be very nasty if a fire was, um, if you want to talk to, to with uh, something um, essential as like a patient with some kind of weird version number like version 2.1.1 behind the name. So it's, it's not what you want to communicate in, at least not in human contact. So, um, and they're, uh, as you can see here, they're hard, harder to read and most people think they're ugly. Um, There's another problem that if you make um, these versions hard-coded, as, as we call that, it makes it uh, error-prone. So if you, for example, you have a new implementation guide that you're going to publish online with all kinds of uh, uh, profiles that people are going to use, you will have to update all the versions, that the resource that you've changed, and that means a lot of detailed communication that's not very obvious from the beginning. So people might think, well, I used, I used your patient, I see there's an update, but I'm still gonna use your patient. But no, if you're going to put the version in the canonical, you're going to refer to the old patient. Um, so if you refer to that old version, your identification is lost. Uh, you see an example here of a patient instance that refers to uh, some kind of uh, patient from your organization and let's say there's a little fix in June, you're not going to refer to that uh, version anymore. So that means all client apps won't be able to communicate with your uh, server anymore. So the second attempt that we did in Fire was think what, what can we do to, to, to keep the power of a canonical URL and have the version in it and that is by uh, inventing a special syntax uh, with a pipe token. So the pipe that you see here is not part of the canonical URL, it's part of the canonical reference. The canonical URL identifies the resource and the ID, the version number behind it just refers to which version of that canonical we're talking about. Um, now, the problem that we discovered afterwards is that there was still a major form of what we call um, dependency hell, because if you start putting reference versions in reference explicitly, then uh, all kinds of weird stuff will break. For example, um, you think you refer yourself to the correct versions, but then indirectly other um, resources might have changed, which cause um, uh, incompatibilities 
uh, where neither server or neither implementation is correct anymore. Um, the other one is that you get um, just like with the with the, the canonicals uh, with the versions in themselves, you get what we call non-synchronous updates. So the the e evolution of one resource will go faster than the evolution of another resource, and that means that you uh, will have to communicate to your users, to the implementers, a whole range of versions every time that you uh, have a new release or a new IG published somewhere. So they cannot just trust, okay, I'm using your resources, I have the, 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 the canonicals right. Um, you, they, everybody will have to check every single version of every single resource before they can be sure that they can communicate with you. So we did a third attempt, uh, and that was what if we look at from the perspective of the publication itself. So we, we are going to uh, upgrade the versions of all the resources at the same time. So if the patient goes to the next versions, the organization, organization will by definition go to the next version, the allergy will go to the next versions, and they will all be the same. And the good part of this, of course, is that you only have to communicate one version. And that's not too hard. But there is a problem, and that is you make false breaking changes. So if you have a reference to a patient 1.2 and somebody upgrades their uh, implementation, then you're still referencing to 1.2. They still have the exact same patient on the server, the exact same definition, yet the version is different. So you're communicating changes that are not there. Another problem with bulk updates um, is that the changes uh, have to happen usually after procurement. So after a process of saying, okay, our, our resources now are now vetted, they're correct, they're final. After that, you still have to do a bulk update, which changes the inside of your structure definition. So actually, you're breaking protocol. Um, and another problem, it's getting harder to deploy you need yet another tool to make to do this bulk update. Um, and then the last problem that is that implementers can still choose and create version dependency hell. So even though you updated all your versions, a, s a single implementer can still refer to an older version because he thinks, well, that's the one I want to use. So after long uh, hard thinking by a lot of people, <coughs> um, we realized that the real problem was actually somewhere else than in those canonicals. The real problem um, is that we are versioning individual resources where we're actually talking about a version of a release. And I'll give you a little scenario here. So imagine there's a hospital and two uh, GPs uh, communicating with each other. Um, and let's start with one resource, uh, a patient. And so you, you must think that the, the hospital has created profile on patient and the two GPs have created their own profile based on that patient from the hospital. So they are compatible. The GPA and the GPB are not compatible, but they are compatible both with the hospital. Now imagine that the hospital goes to a new version then the patients from the GPs become incompatible, so they have to upgrade. And what you will see that not all organizations are capable of updating quickly, and therefore when the hospital doesn't update, they will, in a lot of cases, make a, a duplicate uh, API. So they keep the old API for some of their uh, connections and they create a new API. Um, for the newer versions that they hope everyone will start to use. So far, so good. And you can see the, so General Practitioner B has updated, uh, created new version two, and GPA has some evolution, but still uh, uh, depends on 1.1. <coughs> now, the reality, of course, is that the, the situation is much more complex. So 
these versions I'm describing here are not part of the canonical URL, just indicating that I'm uh, pointing to the version of an individual resource. So the, the situation we just described was overseeable, but if you look at the whole situation, it is no longer overseeable because everyone can pick and choose any resource they want. And even though the hospital upgraded to 2.0, um, they won't have be able to update or to have all the interfaces, all the APIs available for each individual uh, profile. There might be some via servers that are capable of that, but the most won't. It just costs too much money. Um, so, um, the next problem that you can see here is that uh, basically what I just said was that they can pick and choose. So they can either upgrade everything or just one. So the GPA can refer to a version two of the uh, interface or next version, but you know, you cannot force them easily to, to upgrade everything at once. And if you do it, it's very complicated. <coughs> so what you see will, what will happen um, is that um, uh, th that there will be different uh, APIs and they will say, uh, the hospital will say, okay, you have to communicate with this API, uh, which it has a version of its own. The thing of course now is that you have just created more versions. So the profiles now have their own versions and the API has its version. Um, you can, of course, once again, what we previously described, bulk update all the resources to the version of the API. But then the question becomes, what's the point? Um, and that's where we came with our solution. If we're going to upgrade all the, um, if we're going to say the actual version that we want to talk about is the API or the release, then not make that the central point and let's distribute it that way. And that's where we came uh, to the point of saying, okay, let's make it into a package of some kind, one way or another. In other words, don't version the items, but version the set. This is a bit of an um, um, extreme move to the other side. And I will discuss more in detail later that, that it might not be for all cases, but the basic principle is, in most cases, you want to version the set. And the funny thing is, in Fire, we by accident already did it do it this way. Because look at the same picture of previously, the canonical URLs of DST1 and R4 are the same. The only thing we changed was the package. So we are now at attempt four. And this is um, where we as a fire community are. Uh, we've chosen to not necessarily version the items, but we want to version the set. And we chose to do that with packages. And so the second half of this talk is going to be about what are packages then? How did we solve that? So the first thought is if we want to um, version the whole package, let's make it a package and version the package instead of, uh, sorry, pa package the, ver well, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm always thinking which way is the best way to make the sentence, but it works both ways actually. Um, so the question is, what are packages? So if you look at from a very basic perspective, you can say, okay, a package is a thing. It's a collection of resources. It can be distributed. Um, it could be a zip file or some other file. It could be a folder. Um, and it contains every, every file you want to publish. But it's one thing with one version. But that's not really it, because packages is not something we invented here in Fire. We just, as always, um, we just copied what already existed and either cloned it or extended it um, and if you can see that um, wherever you see packages in the IT industry, you see that it's an ecosystem. It's just not, it's not just a file. And I'm going to show you why it's an ecosystem. So 
imagine there's an author that can build a package with a tool usually. He will put that on a package server. In most IT solutions with packages, you see they put those packages on a server where you can get them. And so the other side, the consumer has a package client and a tool, and sometimes they're the same, um, where they consume these packages and have the content of those packages used. And the good part of the package client is usually that it understands versioning of the server. Um, and even better, it's usually also the case that the package authors can use the tool and the ecosystem itself to build upon. So they can consume packages from others and build on top of those packages. So, assuming that we have an ecosystem and some kind of file, then the next question, of course, is how are we going to do this in Fire? And for Fire, we've chosen to use the NPM standard. And NPM is a reasonably old standard uh, used by uh, JavaScript, the JavaScript community. Um, but I'm not going to do go into detail with that. Uh, it's pretty technical and quite honestly, it's reasonably irrelevant how you technically solve it. You know, the, the most package systems today are pretty mature and have solved a lot of the problems that you will encounter if you try to invent it yourself. Um, so we are not going to do that. We're just going to take over the philosophy of this system. So in Fire, it will look like this. You have a package ecosystem with a Fire server that can consume packages, and you have an author with a tool that can produce packages. And a Fire server can consume a package and by that implement a complete implementation guide. The other thing, once again, is that the authors can build on the work of other authors by consuming their packages. Now, this is how it looks in reality, in a little bit more detail. So you will have a package repository that could be uh, a file system or a database. There will already be a package server that serves those packages, so it understands the protocol of the package philosophy. And there's a package client that communicates to that server. Usually, in most package systems, there is a cache. That's where you get a package, where you store it once you got it, because why get it every time you need it? And there is, in a lot of thing, cases, a context in Fire that will be your own project, um, where you say which part of a package cache you want to use, because you, know, <coughs> you won't be using always everything you downloaded. Um, so here you can see a little bit how it works and how, how it every step of the way you filter a bit of your data. So on the right you see a package server containing everything, or at least a lot. Um, then the next step is in your local computer, you have a cache, which is a subset of everything on the server, everything you downloaded. And after that, you have a context that you need for validation. And that once again is a subset of your local cache. But that also could be a fire server. You know, this local uh, context is what you actually work with in a specific situation. And so a validation tool can use say, okay, I'm going to use these two uh, packages uh, with all the resources in them to validate. Now, the nice thing about packages is that almost all package philosophies work with dependencies. So you can say, I have a direct dependency on US Core Lab, but US Core Lab has an indirect dependency on HL7 Fire Core. Of course, from a package perspective, it's a direct dependency. And so in your local cache, a package tool will resolve everything you need. So there will be a HL7 Fire <coughs> Core, or even though you never explicitly said that you wanted to have it. The moment that you say, I want US Core Lab with all the resources in it, you will automatically get US uh, HL7 Fire Core with everything in it. And uh, the package tool will make sure he, he, he will get it. <coughs> um, so, now, what do Fire packages solve? 
first of all, of course, the version uh, issues that we just described, but it solved more. And that's why we, most of the people that started working with this ID became very enthusiastic. So first of all is the maintenance. So um, there's no need to, uh, to, to have individual resources. You still can, of course, because Canonical URLs still have that option, but you don't have to anymore. Um, there's no cascading profile updates. So if you say, okay, I'm going to have an update of this uh, profile, uh, then I'm going to update my reference, but therefore I have to update this profile. But then the profile that's using that profile has a new reference now as well, so it needs to update as well. So the whole chain of the, the cascading of changes that happen if you update one resource is uh, now solved. And uh, the version uh, mix and dependency hell is for large parts solved as well. The second one is what we just described is the distribution. So a fire server is perfect for distributing individual resources and it will always be valuable to fetch structure definitions and other uh, conformance resources from a fire server. But if you want to get a lot, we now have a system that basically is able to distribute a complete implementation guide in one file and tooling to help you find it and get it. The third one is that it's now m way, way easier to communicate to uh, the people that you work with and the people in your ecosystem um, to tell that there, is, there has been a new release, a new version update. You know, in the, if, you, if you only have an implementation guide and a server somewhere, you will have to start mailing around. You will have to tell people, okay, people, please update, there's a new version. And, um, and so once they use packages, their tools will inform them that there is an update. So you don't have to do it anymore. It will happen by default. That doesn't mean they have to update, but they can, and they will be informed. Um, now, what do fire packages look like? It is based on the MPro NPM protocol, and <coughs> that solves for us several things. So the first thing that's very important for a package is that it also, just like a canonical, has to have a globally unique name. Um, we've chosen uh, in Fire to say, okay, um, in the NPM world, it's very, uh, the naming of packages is very liberal, and we say we want to be a bit more strict. We're not going to enforce it hard, but you should at least say where is the region that these profiles are supposed to be used which the author or the organization that created the, those resources or where the fire server of these profiles is supposed to live. And of course, if you have more packages, um, more subjects, more topics, more use cases, then please mention that as well in the form of a subject <coughs> with dots in between. <coughs> the second part of a, pro of a package is uh, pretty straightforward. It contains files and those files uh, contain resources in XML or JSON. And we're thinking of making JSON the standard, um, but that's not completely final yet. <coughs> the third one that is very, very, very important is how you version a um, package. And for that, we've chosen Semver, or actually NPM has chosen Semver, and most package um, ecosystems use that protocol uh, because it's uh, I think you almost universally adopted in the, in, in the uh, IT industry. Um, and Semver is a way of communicating in a semantic way what your upgrade meant. So each um, number in, the, in a version has a specific meaning. So if you update the first, you are communicating to your user that there's a breaking change. And uh, the next one, the minor version, uh, tells the, the, the consumer about backwards compatible additions. Uh, the patch about <laughs> fixes and the label just annotations like this is preview one, don't use it yet in production or this is a, a test or whatever. Um, it will, if you list uh, a package with several of its versions, it will look something like this. And the fourth part of a package is that it has a manifest uh, and the NPM packages, they're called a package.json was a bit unfortunate because um, we already use JSON in Fire a lot, but we think we'll manage. And a, and a, and a manifest basically contains all its metadata. 
Um, there's a special thing about packages that I've touched briefly, and that is packages all have dependencies. Not all, but they can have. They all can have dependencies. So, for example, let's say that the VA has a vaccination uh, package. They will uh, probably make a separate package for the patient care because that can be used in a lot more use cases than this specific one. <coughs> for example, they can also use it for their, sorry, for their observations. Um, and there's a special case that we think is going to be very uh, valuable, and that is what we call meta packages. Those are packages that actually don't contain anything except the references to other packages. So they basically describe um, the aggregation of several use cases. And so with the proper tooling, you can just say, I want the complete profile set of the VA, so I'm going to get the VA all package, and by that I'm drawing in all the packages and all the right versions that I need um, to work with them. Um, in the core, we'll, we, with the, the core resource, we expect something like this. Not sure how exactly it's going to look, but you will have probably some HL7 Fire Core package that is a meta package for everything else. Um, the nice thing is that if you now upgrade a package, there's nothing wrong. Nothing in the world changes. I just upgraded the package, I published it, and there's a new version. But so as long as somebody uses VA all, he won't notice anything. He will probably notice that there's a possible update somewhere, but no need to use it. Then if you say, okay, I'm going to build upon that in my next version of my vaccination package, I can upgrade that package and so forth. <coughs> Now, the most vital thing about packages is that if you have a package, just like if you have a profile, you're doing it to work with other people. So you're part of an ecosystem, and you have to make sure that the philosophy and the, the system that you have um, can be trusted, because you're just a brick in the wall. You know, if you d of course, the, the bottom layer of the bricks is the fire core profiles, but everything above that, you know, people uh, will derive from your profiles. Um, so, there are two rules. Packages cannot be changed, and packages cannot be deleted. There were some cases in the past, f f by in at some package managers, um, some people might recognize the term left pad, um, I won't go into it, but let's just say that all websites all over the world broke down the same day because someone deleted its package. So packages should not be deleted. Um, I've got a few more slides with just some questions I've heard over the past few days, and I will go into them. Um, if you have more stringent questions, please ask them, uh, but I will just continue. So I, I mean, I will answer your question, but uh, until then. Um, so the first question is, what is the state of packages in Fire now? Because, you know, it's not in production yet. It's not part of um, DSQ3. Uh, we're not even sure it's going to be part of R4. Um, but we are actually working on it, and uh, some of the tools are already using it. For example, Graham's build tool is already working with packages it cannot live without anymore. Uh, the tooling from my company, uh, we've built everything right now. We're building everything on, on top of packages. You know, it's going to be our primary philosophy. Um, but it's, not, it's, it's a, an early draft, and so that also means that everyone here and everyone in the fire communities can still contribute to it, bring in their own thoughts, bring in their own criticism, and say, well, you know, maybe this is not the right way. Or if you have questions, please ask them, because that helps the people that do uh, want to change or make it perfect um, can work, uh, can, 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 can adapt to it. Um, so, what do you need, when do you need to create a package? Because not always when you, cr when you create a profile, it's necessary to immediately create a package. I think the basis is when you have more than one profile and you want to have a consistent way of communicating communicate that to other people. Then it becomes sensible um, to start creating a package because it's, it's, it's an early or it's an easy way to, to communicate and distribute. Um, 
How do you create a package? There are several ways. S we, we try to stay as much as we can compatible with NPM, so the NPM ecosystem can be used to create fire packages. Um, I personally think that in the end we will need more, um, that we will create a more extension on, on NPM. Um, for example, you want to search on canonical URLs, you want to have special uh, tools that integrate with resolving and validation and stuff like that. Um, but you can use NPM. Um, I think Graham has also, also already has created a tool where you can build a package with. We have created a command line tool where you can build a package. Our online uh, tooling in simplify.net uh, also you can create a package already. And we hope that there will be many more. Um, but there are tools available. Um, you can publish a package uh, in several ways. Um, you can basically use any NPM compatible server. Uh, we personally uh, believe that it's vital for the FIRE community to have their own package ecosystem. And it could be that we, uh, we're going to move to a, a, a package registry on FIRE.org. Um, we already have a working package registry on uh, Simplify that you can try it if you want. Um, but you can also publish those packages on other places. So packages uh, work best in a, fire, in, a, in a package server, but they can just be published as files. Um, now, how do I use a package? Um, you can download and extract one, put them in your local folder, but um, we are already uh, working on a lot of tools to have packages uh, consumable. For example, uh, Michel has just created last week a version of Forge that you can just get uh, a fire package from the server. And by that, you don't have to once, uh, like you have to do now, say, okay, let's go to a ser website, find a canonical URL, download the resource, put it in my folder, and now I have a clone of somebody else's resource in my project. That's no longer needed. You can now say, okay, I've got my project, I create a dependency on <coughs> somebody else's package, and all the profiles of that package are automatically available in your snapshotting, uh, deriving of profiles, references, and stuff. What you can put in a package is very free. You can put, um, the, in the most strict form, you can say, okay, let's put a, a set of conformance resources in it, uh, value sets, structure definitions, operation definitions, maybe a, a capability statement, um, but it's very liberal. You can put anything in it. You can put your whole um, implementation guide on it, or you can have uh, multiple folders with extra data or whatever. Uh, that doesn't mean that all tools can use it or understand what you put in it. Um, for Fire, we've chosen to use the packages folder in a package to say, okay, that's where the conformance resources live, the data contract. A question that I've asked, that has been asked for a long, uh, for, for a lot in the past few days uh, is how big should I make my package? And we think that the best granularity is the, um, to think about packages as use cases. So try to make it a scope where people don't have to consume th hundreds of resources that they're never going to use, but also make sure that to implement one use case, don't make them download 10 packages. Um, the very um, important question uh, that a lot of people will ask and have already asked is how can you remove a package from a registry? And the answer is you don't. You should never remove a package from a registry because it is part of somebody else's uh, wall. It's part of the ecosystem. There will be tools available in most package uh, servers probably to, to deprecate a, um, a package so that uh, the consumers know, okay, I'm still building on it. I will, if I want to, I can always, but there's a warning that you shouldn't. Um, and in some servers you can unlist packages. Um, so w another question that has been asked in the past few days, does that mean that we're going to remove versions from canonicals? So far, we don't have any indication that we will. It's way too early to make that decision, and the chances are very big that we will always allow versions on canonical URLs because there are use cases where that is relevant. But um, <coughs> we also think that there will be a lot of use cases where it's no longer necessary once you properly scope 
uh, your server, your context, your IG around packages. Um, yeah, I think those are the most important questions that I've heard. Um, do you have any questions? No questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, so I guess I'm thinking, so NPM has its own uh, version hells. Um, so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. So things like, um, in a sense, in typical NPM, you just say you have some packages with a star or a hat, whatever, say anything compatible with this, so different people installing at different times will have different states of dependencies, even though they install like, the same thing. Um, and also the fact that so you had this, if you had these trees, um, so you had a diamond where both packages based on the same one, but you could have things that are just go on trees and you have things referring to patient one, version one, another resource referring to patient 1.2, another referring to 2.0, and that if you sub package, they will still end up referring to incompatible versions. You have all the, yeah. the several different, your dependency yeah. will have a whole bunch of, uh, when you resolve it, different packages. The, 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 there, there are actually two questions here. So the first question is, uh, what happens in, in most package systems like NPM, you can wildcard the version. So uh, say, give me 1.x. So that could be 1.0, 1.1, 1.2. That means if there's an update, you know, you will get a different set than you had last week or different than the other guy. Um, that currently is a possibility, but I believe that that only creates uh, dangerous and pitfalls. So I would personally um, think we should um, at least advise in the standard eventually to not do that. Maybe even say, you're, we're not going to allow it or we're not going to build it in our tools. But um, it's, it's too early for that, to, to make that decision. I, I think it's generally unadvisable to, to, to work that way, um, but you know, w w there will have to be made some decisions around that. Um, your other question was um, incompatible uh, uh, diamonds, and you know, if you have two packages that refer to a different package of different versions, um, I think that in Fire, the, the tree of dependencies will be a lot less than in most um, uh, JavaScript uh, uh, solutions, but they can occur, and um, there are multiple philosophies around it, and I think in Fire we'll just have to figure out what are the best, and maybe it's even up to the, the, to the use case to decide what the solution should be. For example, there are a lot of packages that say um, a nearest win, uh, philosophy where you say, okay, if you say I use a package and I use another package that uses the same package, then the one that's closest to my decision is the one that that's will be defining the version. Uh, there are also ones that say, okay, we'll just move to the highest version, but you know, th that's, uh, that's something we really have to talk about in the next year, I think, in Fire, because it pr it's very likely that we'll just say, okay, our tooling is going to say we're not going to allow it at all because it, it for, for healthcare it's maybe too unpredictable to just say, okay, we'll, we'll figure something out. So I'd like to make two comments. Uh, Graham has a, a Notepad++ plugin that has been providing support for packages for a while now. So if you have Notepad++, uh, Notepad++ you can install this tool and play with it and fetch pack packages. And secondly, I'd all like to invite you to join the Zulip stream where Martijn and Graham have been extensively harmonizing this approach. Martijn, do you know this specific s stream or you discuss this? Um, I think it's in the IG uh, stream, but I'm Do you not know sure. Graham, IG? So please, if you have ideas or comments or feedback on this, uh, join that Zulip stream and let us know what you think about it. Yep, go ahead. I'm sorry, we're already a couple of minutes over time. Uh, oh, okay. Well, I will be available for more questions and uh, uh, there, there, the yeah, there are way more people that can answer. This.